Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 230, recorded on December 12th, 2012. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walworth. And I'm Alan Alentano. And we are all here back as a group. The video should look a little bit better if you're watching the video today. Um, as somebody, as we were saying in the chat room, is not the Minecraft edition. Uh, welcome everybody. It is... We're into the middle of December. We are almost to Christmas. My birthday was yesterday, which means you are less than two weeks from Christmas. So I hope everybody's prepared. Um, yeah, but other than that, tech stuff is still moving. Actually, I think we'll see from now through the rest of the month, things will actually pick up as we prepare for uh, CES coming up in the, what is it? The, technically, it starts on the 8th of January. So we have a lot of stuff uh, to, to get ready and prepare for that. If you are just joining us for the first time, pcper.com slash podcast is the URL you should go to, pcper.com slash podcast, where you can subscribe, download our past episodes, uh, find the YouTube videos, all that kind of stuff. And then if you want to join us live, which some of you are doing right now, it's at pcper.com slash live, and it's Wednesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific Otherwise, if you live in a different uh, time zone, do the math yourself because I'm not very good. If you're, if you're in Hawaii, you've got to watch it later. Otherwise, you work. If you live in Hawaii, awesome for you. You don't work. Awesome <laughs> for you. Uh, not so great. It's cold here now. Uh, anyway, let's, let's just jump into stuff. First off, uh, if you are watching live and you want to hang out and maybe play some games with us after the podcast, which we tend to do most weeks, this week we're going to try to play... Planet Side 2, and I emphasize to try to play because I think all of us so far on the show have installed it, uh, turned it on and died a few times, and then go, well, okay, I'm ready for tonight. Is that, is that about accurate? Yeah. I yes. crashed, fell to Earth, stood up, and was immediately shot in the head. So, uh, Planet Side 2, this is, this is what it is. This is actually a uh, currently live running stream on Justin TV of somebody else who's much better than us playing at it. I hope they're better than us. Um, but it's actually a shooter MMO that is this massive world. You know, there are three continents uh, on each server, and, you know, you're fighting for command points and control points, all that kind of stuff. It, it, I, I watched a couple of videos on it last night after we decided this is what we're going to play. And other than realizing that I have no idea what's going on, it looks really fun. It could, it could be cool. It could be cool. So hopefully we'll have a couple people uh, join in, join in on our squad, uh, and then actually know what they're doing enough. What's that big proboscis sticking out of the back of that thing? Yeah. Mm, well. I think that's why it was trying to land on the other plane. You just have to play mm-hmm. and, uh, and figure it out and figure it out. So let's jump into the stories we're going to talk about this week. First up, we have, we have a collection of, of reviews and articles we won't spend a whole lot of time on. Last week, I totally forgot to mention Maury's review of the EVGA Z77 Mini ITX motherboard, the Stinger. This is uh, one of, I guess it's not one of, EG, it's not one of the first EVGA motherboards, right? But it is, I think it's their first Mini ITX board. Um, but it's a Z77 board, Mini ITX, so you get... Ivy Bridge support, Sandy Bridge pr- support. You've got a full-length PCI Express slot at the bottom of that. They even have a... It's hard to see. Where is it at? I think it's... Where's that mini... Where's that? Here it is. You can, you can also use it as a guitar pick. <laughs> Not yes. quite that small. Not quite that small. This right here is a MSATA port. Maybe it's MPCIe with MSATA support. Um, so you can see the, the, the screw placement right there. What's that? Yeah, half height. So... You know, Bluetooth, wireless, uh, maybe some SSDs. Alan, are there some half height M SATA SSDs as well? Half? Like half length? Half! <laughs> yeah, they are. Well, it's sort of like mini, mini. Yeah. Okay. They make them, and they're hard to find. Yeah, yeah. Well, I found that with uh, when we were working on the, um, the Intel NUC as well, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, other spec, I mean, full size PCIe, one mini PCIe, eight channel audio, gigabit Ethernet, mini ITX form factor. Uh, so you, you get all the, the goods involved with that. It's EVGA board, so there's a lot more on overclock. Hang on a second. Hey, hey, dog. <laughs> Go. Your dog is doing jingle bells. She is. Yep. Ching, ching, she's got ching, her, ching, ching. She, she has her Christmas Get into the spirit. And she's, and she's, yeah. So, um, 
USB 3, SATA 6G, HDMI port. Uh, it's got all the goods. But it has, as I was saying before, I was interrupted by my dog. It has, e it has overclocking capability that not a lot of mini ITX motherboards tend to have. Uh, they have specific features like EVGA V droop control, E left, E, or I'm sorry, E left, E elite tuning support, which is E L E E T. I'm sure it's an acronym for something. Um, but it's it's got it's got a solid layout. It's it's a great board. Moore really liked it. Uh, go check out his review um, on the site if you want to read more about it. Mini ITX is becoming very popular these days. People are are more and more likely wanting to build smaller systems. If no, if for no other reason than the novelty of having a small form factor system that can do really intense gaming with a full PCI Express slot, you can put a 670, 680, or something a little bit smaller in there if you want uh, as well. Pricing wise, $199 on Newegg, so not cheap, uh, but most of these higher end Z77 Mini ITX boards are about that price as well. He had some issues with the UEFI BIOS not being mouse enabled. To me, that's not really that big a deal. Uh, kind of weird that it should be in there, then it's not. Um, go, go old school. Use a keyboard. That's right. I, I'm a fan of the arrow keys in the inner in the inner key. So check out that review if you haven't. Also, we had Chris on last week, and I don't know why I just kind of spaced on it. We didn't get Chris on this week, but he posted two more instances of his cutting the cord series. Uh, one of them, part three here, is on the OS install and tuning. That's pretty simple. It just goes through the Windows 7 installation process, how to set up the uh, the UEFI, the BIOS, to correctly you know, have all your AHCI settings and all that kind of stuff um, set up for you. So if you've, it, you know, it, it walks through step by step the installation of the operating system as well, and then he goes into some of the options. Uh, if I scroll down and down and down and down, on keep the, scrolling down on the last few pages, uh, on the last page about tweaks you can do, how you can adjust the page files, making sure you adjust the power options and the firewall options so that the system doesn't go to sleep, uh, which you obviously don't want a home theater PC to do all that kind of stuff, uh, and so and how to disable the hibernate and all that kind of deal. So you can check that out. And then part four was released. This is building um, the HTCP going into the media center installation, the media center configuration, uh, how you set up the tuners, how you can go through uh, and set up all your channels and presets and uh, how the tuners integrate and all that other kind of stuff. And then again, on the last page, how you can actually um, hook up your TV wrapping up, all that kind of stuff. And there is one more part that's going to launch tomorrow, Thursday. If you're listening to this recorded, you're not watching the live version, it should be uh, available uh, probably already. And that part five is Media Center add-ons and options. And that's where he goes into some, some extra software that maybe tweaks the Media Center process, the Media Center experience a little bit, make it a little bit more user-friendly, a little bit more... Um, compatibility with different things uh, and that will wrap up the series and then we have what I think is a pretty good collection of articles on building a home theater PC. Maybe we'll have him on next week as well to kind of give us a summary of everything of his, because obviously he's writing these articles because he was building one himself and curious to see what his overall experience is and uh, whether or not he really recommends people doing it in this way or if he would go back and change anything or anything like that. It should be interesting. Uh, how about low end power, not low end, let's say low power power supplies. We usually talk about 1200 watts, 1600 watt power supply. Seasonic has a 360 watt power supply and Lee posted a review of this. It's actually, uh, the, the lowest wattage of their G series, which is, uh, not the Gatorade drink, but a standard cable, kind of a low cost version uh, of the power supply. It goes from 360 up to 650. We looked at the smallest, physically smallest and smallest power um, version just to kind of see, because there's a lot of people, if you're building a home theater PC, if you're building uh, a, a mini ITX system, 360 watt power supply is going to be right in your warehouse if you're not using discrete graphics, right? So if you're, if you're just using uh, a Lano system, uh, Trinity system, you're just using Ivy Bridge system, you're not using discrete graphics. This is the kind of power supply that you're going to want to look at. Um, and the only weakness that he has is that the fan does get a little loud at 100% load, but chances are mini ITX or, or home theater PC, you're not going to be pushing it at 100% load uh, anyway. And it's $59.99 on Newegg as of this month. So pretty good. Yes, you, you could be doing something really wrong if you're running it at full load. As a quiet home theater PC. Well, you know, it's if you get, 
there would be maybe there might be some people that get the 360 watt. I'm power just gonna supply. solder some extra resistors in between wires. Well, maybe you, maybe you have maybe you have a lot of hard drives. Uh, maybe you have a discrete card in there that you that it says recommended power supply is 350. But when you're gaming, it actually kind of stretch it, stresses the power supply out to its level, um, to a, to its highest level. But you shouldn't do that. Instead, you should maybe get that 450 watt and leave yourself uh, a little bit of wiggle room on that. Wee, 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 wee. Oh. No, no. They broke up, so we can't sing that up anymore. Wait, wait, what? <clears throat> LMFAO <clears throat> broke up? Yeah, you didn't hear that? Ken, is this true? Uh, Ken doesn't know. That means it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be crazy. Uh, okay, and the last story, we literally just published it right before the podcast, and I think I can still, I can, I can still hear Alan tweaking away at his picks. Tweaking away. He's awfully close to the computer screen. I think, it's, I think that's what's going on. Um, this is our PC Perspective Holiday Buying Guide. We try to do one of these every year. And uh, Tim, I, I guess he borrowed some of this picture and added to it and edited it. Um, but otherwise, it was going to have a really cheesy thing if I had been the one to do it. So to thank you, Tim, for making our holiday gift guide image. And we go through uh, picks from myself. We have Josh, Jeremy, Allen, Ken, Tim, Scott, Chris, and Maury. So we'll just figure we go through here. We'll each talk about ours that are the, those of us that are on our podcast uh, and kind of go over why we picked those. So here's mine. This is kind of like a hardware software pick of the week, but expanded out and earlier in the show. Uh, and I think I might have already picked this once for my thing. So this is the iFixit Pro Tech Toolkit. This is exactly what it sounds like. It has a 54-bit driver set. It has spudgers, plastic ones and metal ones. It has all kinds of tweezers. It has suction cup. It has uh, anesthetic wristband, which only, only losers really use anyway, let's be honest. In fact, I have shag rug and <laughs> only socks on my feet when I build computers. And you... Uh, and I go around in circles around the table <laughs> dragging my feet. Exactly. Before I touch any <laughs> electronic component. Because if it can't handle the shock... It can't handle my usage. Exactly. Uh, that's actually a pretty cool kit, and it's now cheaper than when I paid for it as well. You can get it for $59 bucks, uh, through ifixit.com. I also selected the A105800K Trinity APU. This kind of goes back to our discussions we were having about home theater PCs, small form factor builds. If you're trying to build a low-cost, um, small system that doesn't need a discrete card that can do mainstream gaming, Pretty much all of your normal computing that you would do on a home theater PC, this is going to have that power. It does have a little bit, it has a 100 watt TDP, which isn't great, but considering you get really good performing, uh, really good performing integrated graphics inside that 100 watt TDP, as, long, uh, as well as a quad core 4.2 gigahertz, up to 4.2 gigahertz quad core processor, that's not too bad. It's pretty good. Um, so if you're looking to build a small form vector system or a home theater PC, something like that, give that a look. Uh, I'm a big fan of extended phone batteries. I have one on my Galaxy Nexus. This, this one that's actually pictured here. It is a 3,900 milliamp hour battery. The default is 1,800 milliamp hour, so more than double the battery capacity. Yes, it makes it look like it has a tumor a little. It's like the Excelsior from Star Trek. It's the pregnant whale. You know what I'm saying? No, I don't. What kind of science fiction fan are you? I never, I was never into Star Trek. Let's move on. Oh. Uh, so, extended batteries, they can get kind of expensive. This one was 90 bucks, um, which is, you know, if you, like about the price of the phone, if you buy it on contract or something like that through Verizon or Sprint. But I think um, for me, as I think I say this in here, uh, if there's one thing it turns out I am a fan of on mobile devices, it's mobility. Um, yes, they're kind of pricey, uh, but the ability to go two full days with a modern smartphone without needing to find a wall outlet is quite liberating. Uh, and my final pick is the Corsair Vengeance 2000 wireless headset. These were used quite a bit when I was in Austin, uh, when I was living there in, in a one bedroom apartment with my wife while also working from that same apartment and I wanted to work and I needed peace and quiet, but I also needed some background sound. The ability to have a wireless headset to me, this was like my first, I think, real wireless headset. And the ability to get up and walk around and go to the refrigerator or go into the room or, you know, move around without having to worry about pulling a cable 
out of the out of the back of the computer or taking my, making sure to remember to take off your headphones before you get up and move around is actually pretty nice. And the audio quality was good. Uh, the microphone quality was pretty good. The only downside is having to remember to charge it every day. Otherwise, you have to sit there with a USB cord plugged into your the side of your head while you use it. So, uh, and those are... Let me see how much those actually cost because I kind of forgot. 99 bucks. Pretty good. Not too shabby. Holiday gift guide savings through uh, 1118. I don't know if that's for ours, but it's one of them. All right, next up, Josh, what, what are your glorious picks? Okay. Uh, the first couple, <clears throat> as you know, I've been working on the, uh, the AMD liquid cooling system, and it is surprisingly similar to the Corsair H80. That's because they're both produced by the same company, Acetek, A-S-E-T-E-K, thanks to Ken. It's got a lot of interesting features to it. It cools very, very well, and uh, it's pretty quiet for the most part, unless you really want to get it going, and then it does get loud. If you do it at yeah, 100% can. or extreme cooling, you can be in the same room with it for an extended period of time, but if you do it silent or custom, what do you it think does about very, the, very well. the pump noise? Is it the pump noise or the fan noise? No, fan noise, because it's got okay. the dual 120s. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. Okay. And so the second one, uh, MSI R7970 Power Edition. Now, a few months ago, I, uh, I reviewed the Lightning, which is essentially this very same card, except clocked higher. This is a more reference clock board. It's 925 megahertz. And uh, it uh, does the exact same thing as the Lightning. You just have to work a little harder to get it up there. <laughs> Uh -huh. Does it support but anyway, displays? excellent cooling. Six active outputs, okay. so you can have six screens on there. The only downside is that um, uh, there's no dual link DVI output. Uh, if you want to have a resolution above 1920 by 1200, then you need to use DisplayPort, which mm. okay. still very few. It's monitors. interesting because on the Asus Matrix card, it has a similar problem. But it has a switch on top of it that enables one of the DVI ports to be dual link. So that yeah, you can yeah. do that. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, they, they, it's in BIOS. And so that's a, that's mm. a handy thing that Asus did. Mm. For my third pick, and one that I've been using for quite some time, is the Corsair Obsidian 650D. Now, I, I've really enjoyed using this case. It's my main one right now. It's, it's got a lot of space because I need space. Liebentraum. Ah, uh, you can uh, wonderful cord handling capabilities. It's got the front USB 3.0 ports and a couple other ports, which is nice. And they, that's just done a flip uh, flip down corner cover. Yep. Uh, cooling, of course, is excellent. It's very quiet. Construction is is very good. I just you know I think for the price, it is a case that has everything that I could possibly need from it. And uh, about the only bad side to it is uh, the 120 or 180 millimeter fan that came with it. It locked up. I tried to uh, kind of re-lube it and free things up. And uh, I just ended up breaking some of the fittings, and so it never really worked again. And it's unfortunate. Uh, the other part is that it does not have the USB 3.0 motherboard headers. It's got the, uh, the usual yeah. pass-through cables that you plug into the back of your motherboard that has the regular USB 3.0 slots. I think newer version, I think later versions of the case maybe shipped with that? No, no, no. The, they have not yet done a refresh oh, okay. that has right. that particular thing. Now the, uh, what, the Carbide deal, 300R? But, yeah. That does have that, uh, but the 650D still does not, but for like 12 bucks more, you can add one of those Silverstone uh, you know, USB 3.0 uh, plug to the motherboard header converter and uh, so you can right. easily easily gotcha. do that yourself uh, my SSD pick of course you gotta have one uh, the Samsung 840 Pro 256 uh, unfortunately we just missed out on the whole Assassin's Creed 3 thing but mm -hmm. still it's a decent price for a fast fast SSD and finally for my last pick it's a software pick Sins of a Solar Empire I've played way too much of this with myself and my friends <laughs> <laughs> that I do have a few friends. But anyway, uh, it's a fantastic game that's a lot of fun. But if you play it, expect to be sitting down for about like the next five to six hours if you want to finish it all in one time. Oh, really? Yes, each round is long. That's what she said. 
All right. Yes. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank uh, you. Rousing picks. Uh, I think I think the community will love it. Jeremy. Well, unfortunately, what I was hoping to pick was a nice thin bezeled uh, monitor for everybody. And well, actually, the AOC one that we heard so much about with a two centimeter thick uh, bezel. Well, that's just a plastic bit. There's still another ten centimeter, centimeters or so underneath the glass, which is not going to display video. So for the price that they're charging, hey, it does look pretty, but if you're desperately hoping that this is it, this is finally going to be the machine without a basil bugging me for iFinity, it's not going to happen this year. Sorry, guys. Fair enough. So what did we find? Well, on the other hand, uh, one thing, which is what you're looking at right now, uh, the Logitech C920 Pro webcam. It's what most of us here have been using on PC Perspective Podcast for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it provides quite a decent picture. It's a decent price right now, $75 on sale at Newegg. And it'll do 180 or 1080p, absolutely no problem, if it's recording or if it's broadcasting, as long as you've got, of course, the bandwidth to support it. And a decent set of uh, controls to make sure that you'll look as good as, well, as good as we can in even the best lighting. Definitely worth trying out, and you know exactly what it looks like because you've been watching it for years. Next up is something that's it's 20 bucks or free if you really want to go that way, and it will be a lot of fun to play with, which is AMD just released the Radeon RAM disk today. So it's a software RAM disk. You can, if you pay for it, put up to 64 uh, gigs of your system onto RAM, assuming you've got that. They didn't break it down for the paid version that you have to use Radeon branded memory. You don't. They didn't say you had to use an AMD processor. Huh. You don't. You can do it with Intel as well. So it makes sense to build popularity for their brand. But, you know, it was a lot of fun. What they were seeing is for boot times, not the best because, I mean, seriously, are you going to load the entire operating system on there? Well, it's not quite going to work that way because it needs a working partition to be able to back itself up onto at boot. You can dump some system files on there, but it treats it exactly like a drive, so you can install actual programs onto it. It does back it up on a schedule that you set to a hard drive location, so it's going to be there when you reboot. You don't have to worry about getting rid of it. And the reviews I've seen, they were only using DDR3-1600, and load times were obscene, blowing SSDs right out of the water. So it might actually be a reason to buy high-end RAM. Your system might not notice it, but the uh, yeah, yeah, the RAM drive will. Uh, as well, I also went with a slightly different uh, 7970. But I think the fact that both Josh and I have picked one sort of tells you what, this is the card to go for. If you want to wait until quarter one and hope that NVIDIA and AMD actually deliver on what they're promising and that the silicon will actually be there for purchase and it will actually be great, hey, go for it. On the other hand, if you've got 380 bucks, 360 after you get the mail-in rebate card, you can pick up a Sapphire Radeon HD 7970 with the Never Settle bundle. So you get yourself four games and a brand new 7970 for under $400. Really not a bad thing. Yep. And it will do everything Josh said it would. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least is something that we've been seeing a lot of. The Parrot AR Drone 2.0, the sort of latest and greatest Wi-Fi enabled quadrocopter. It comes with an outside gear, which is the picture there. It also comes with an inside uh, chassis that you can put over so it's soft when it's bouncing off of hard things. And it's got protectors around the propeller blades if it's bouncing off of loved ones or others. So you get a lot out of it. There are umpteen billion apps that you can do. You can, since it's Wi-Fi enabled, you can control it from an iPad, your cell phone, a computer, whatever you really feel like. So it's it's going to be a lot of fun. There's a lot of community mods out there uh, for software, uh, essentially little VR games that you can play with it, uh, camera capture software, all sorts of fun little things. It is a little expensive at $300. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, if you take care of it, you are going to have a blast. I, I have one of these, and I took it to uh, the beach one year when we went on vacation. And the only problem—it's not amphibious, Ryan. Well, no, no, it wasn't. It didn't get. It didn't go into the water or anything like that. The problem is, is it's very sensitive to wind. Oh, I would suspect. Um, and on a beach, there are other people, and sometimes 
the wind points to those people and the spinning fan blades of death, uh, at least that's what it appears like to them, will like take it right into other people. So be careful. So you should have put the protectors on. But the blades don't hurt. I, 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 I kind of like stuck my arm up into the blades once just to make sure. I mean, they're, 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 they're made to like, uh, what do they call it, like breakaway type stuff anyway, a little bit. Like, so, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, considering we're the type of people that test whether a fan's working properly or not by sticking our fingers in it, you know, <laughs> yeah, you've got a bit of a callus going. <laughs> <laughs> and then last but not least, if you're oh. having trouble getting into the holiday spirit, pick yourself up a bottle of Brook Lottie with Port Charlotte on the label. It will be the best scotch you have ever had. Nice. Nice. All right. Take it away, Alan. Alan. All right. So all you jokers picked SSDs, but uh, I sort of picked like a little mini selection there okay um i kicked it off by saying the the vector the samsung 840 pro or 830 and the intel 335 series are all pretty darn good um are those all seven millimeter ssds the first first three of them are actually i need to tweak the wording in that uh the first three of those four are the 335 series for some reason intel decided to divert away from their normal seven millimeter right chassis thing yeah, because I had that right problem that's yesterday. I was trying to install an SSD into my new laptop, and uh, the laptop had a seven millimeter hard drive in it that I was replacing. But the SSD I was trying to shove in there was not seven millimeter. Try as I might, uh, pushing, I had to, I had to rip apart the, the SSD. It doesn't look pretty, but it fits. Yeah, so yeah, nice. you can. That's, that's not a trick. If you have a twelve millimeter form factor SSD. And you're trying to shoehorn it into something that's really tiny. If you're willing to have a bare drive, a bare PCB in there, sure. um, with maybe some double-sided tape, just sort of holding it in place. I use some gaff tape able- to make, like you know how they have like the little. Um, and that's how flaps. Ryan is now bare. That's how you have those little flaps, yeah. to, like pull the drive out. I had to like make one of those on the. It's. I mean, it's the tape is on the memory chips, but I'm sure that's yeah. fine. It's really it's it, that's fine. It's like it's they, almost they, like a until of course you pull the memory chips off of the PCB. Well, that would that's be right. impressive. I've seen it happen. All right, what else you got so, for us? Those those are some pretty good picks. Uh, but generally, I would I'd say that solid state drives, as most of us can attest to, if you have any system with a hard drive in it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I know somebody that has a fairly recent MacBook Pro, and the thing is just dog slow, and it's only because of they just got the hard drive model instead of the solid state drive model. It's painful to use. It's just an atrocity. Anyway, um, so yeah, hard drive's bad for your OS. So save. If you know somebody that has one, save them. Get them an SSD. Um, next pick, uh, Shure earbuds. I freaking love these things. Um, especially the recent ones that come with uh, the other cable, the other, the other cable set. Um, the ones I pointed to right here is the SE-115M+. Plus. Um, those are the one set of Shure earbuds that don't have the detachable cables. They're like the, the very entry-level, bottom-of-the-line one. But the benefit is that they have the, that uh, smartphone connectivity, right? Yeah. So they have that kind of connector that plugs into pretty much any smartphone now. Uh, it has the, the phone all plug that's a little bit extended that has an extra contact on it. Um, and it lets you control your music, and it has the... You know, it has a microphone built into it, everything. So basically, it acts like a headset for your phone, but it's a really good set of earbuds at the same time. And they have higher quality ones on their website. Um, if you want to go a little bit, you know, if you have sort of an audiophile person you're trying to buy the set for. Um, and when you do that, uh, and we talked about this, I think, a few weeks back, I ended up making one of them, what, a pick of the week, I think, yes. a month ago or something. Um, you get the earbuds, they come with their own cable, but then there's like a $40. Uh, add-on cable that adds all this functionality to it, and the and the cable actually unsnaps from the earbuds, which is really cool because if you ever you know really expensive pair of earbuds, the cable breaks. You don't want that to be the end of your earbuds, right? This way you can just get a replacement cable. Um, and last but not least, uh, if you're feeling really spendy and you want to buy someone else a big screen TV, then just get them a smart TV, Samsung type. That's how smart my choice. is it? How, how, how what? How smart is it? How, how smart? Uh, well, it runs Android. And, um, is that one of the ones with the know, webcam that has the recent, really, really released hack that lets it yes, watch you? Yes, there is a recent nice. released hack, which I 
think I got an email today saying that Samsung is rolling out a patch tonight. So I'm guessing that that's because oh, of this. Oh, all the free porn is gone. Yeah, Does the TV all... just speak up every... Does your TV speak up and say, I'm sorry, Alan, but you can't do that? Uh, only occasionally. Um, but if you do get one out... Oh, no, you know, okay, here's the damn TV watching you, and it's going to comment. Yeah. No, it is. That was what the hack was. Um, it's Samsung, I recommend I recommend out. getting the Samsung branded wall mount kit because they have one that's really cool. It's basically a couple of steel stainless steel pucks with the cable in the center of it, and you it has something equivalent to that that goes on your wall, and the the set doesn't sit further than like a half an inch right. away from the wall. It's basically you hang it like a. It's pretty tree. awesome. Yeah, it's I a say, flash like we, we went to eat at a, a restaurant today that had a bunch of really. Those, those, these kind of maybe not this thin, but really thin LCDs, and I was like, oh, oh my TVs are so thick. Yeah. And then I thought, <laughs> who gives a shit? That is stupid. It hangs on the wall. <laughs> so then I moved on. Um, all right, yeah, cool. So yeah, good stuff. that's everybody that's on the podcast. I'll kind of run through here and and detail some of the other ones, or at least uh, high level overview some of the other ones. Ken. Uh, picked the Bear Dynamic DT770 Pro headphones. I believe he's using them right. No, he's not. No, he took those home. Uh, they're too good to keep here. Yep. Um, so those are apparently really good headphones. How much do they cost, Ken? About two hundred dollars. Um, they're the most comfortable pair of headphones you will ever wear. Most comfortable in your pair life. of headphones that you'll ever wear in your life. He says they look plush. Yes, they do. They're plush, but they don't sweat. As compared but to they don't sweat. As compared to Grados. Yeah, exactly. They're plush and they don't sweat, just like Josh. Mm. Oh, I sweat. <laughs> uh, also on the all, list, all in one room this year. See, so, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's a free <laughs> one. Uh, also on the list, a couple of cameras: the Sony RX100 point and shoot. Um, what stands out about here? It is a uh, features a one-inch sensor, unheard of for such a compact camera. Lens capable of an aperture of f1.8, which is really good if you don't uh, really know much about cameras. This is incredibly awesome. 1080p video at 60 frames per second, um, which is uh, better than a lot of dedicated video cameras. And there's some video samples in here. And then the RX100 is 650 bucks. How much is this S100? Uh, about 250 bucks. About 250 bucks. A little yeah. bit step down, but then a little bit step <laughs> up is the Sony RX1. That's about 2,700 dollars. <laughs> Yeah. It's just coming out this month. That's cheap at half the price. Uh, yeah. Did you say a little bit of a step up? <laughs> or just... just a little, just a little bit of a step up. And um, if and then the, he wants a sports car. It's all out of guide. It's two hundred ten thousand dollars. First compact <clears throat> camera with a full frame sensor. The RX one looks like it'll be uh, completely unrivaled. And uh, I'm renting one for CES. And he says he's renting one for CES. So the I'm car not. or the I'll camera? Have, I'll have more. Well, yes, yes. I'm not I, renting both? one for CES. I'll but. steal Francois's GTR <laughs> and rent the camera. Oh, I got so you. Yeah. The, the, uh, there's a, so I've been driving a car for like the past four or five years now and well, has not broken down. And it costs less than that camera. Just saying. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know. And this is a camera that you can put in your pocket and this, easily break. This is a camera that you make money off of. I guess. I bought a wife for $1,300. She does more dishes than you can, so. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, well, we're all going to jail now. And this is why I'm not on the podcast. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Tim Vary, one of our uh, news guys, has posted some stuff. He has the Google Nexus 7 tablet, 16 gig Wi Fi. For 199 bucks, a good selection. I have one of those as well. Silicon Dust Home Run Prime HDHR for $129. One of the best purchases was a cable card tuner, which allowed him to make his own home theater PC and avoid Comcast's expensive cable box. So that's an option. Oops. Excuse me. Excuse my click. How about Kerbal Space Program for $23? It's an indie game being developed by Squaw that has tanked my productivity more than any other game this year. Uh, looks interesting. Similar to Minecraft, the game is available now in beta and status and features being added periodically. $23, not so bad. Everybody everybody at work has been trying to get me hooked. To this? <laughs> on that stinking name. That's all they talk like about. just like the name Kerbal. Kerbal. It's like, yeah, I, I guess it's you like sort of 
mess with all the parameters of a of your spacecraft and see if it can make it into yeah, orbit. There's a, the idea. there's a good quick look on Giant Bomb that is hilarious. Quick look on Giant Bomb, so yeah. we'll have to we'll have to take that. Okay, now let's move on to Scott, who has selected Steel Series Siberia V2 headset available with or without USB sound card. More head uh, headset reputations there. Um, he's Brags about the microphone uh, is unidirectional and does not pick up the Cherry MX Blue switch clicking much, which uh, he's known for. Second pick is an SSD, any decent SSD. Here's a picture of the Vertex there, obviously. Uh, and he says RAM, more RAM, any vector, decent vector. RAM. Yeah, that's a vector, vector. Vector, what did I say? Vertex. Oh, whatever, vertex. it starts with the vertex. V. Vector. Uh, it's all OCC, does. so who cares? Uh, and then we've got the Corsair Dominator Platinum picture, but he says any decent RAM. I would agree. If you're running on, if you're running on two gigs of RAM, what the hell's wrong with you? If you're running on four gigs of RAM, it's really cheap to upgrade to eight. And if you're on eight, that's probably enough. But sixteen, I just bought would be really. Good I just bought a kit. I just bought a kit, twenty-four gig for one hundred and twenty bucks. That's the going right right now. How much? Twenty-four gig for one hundred and twenty dollars. Twenty-four gig is what six stems? Six yeah, four six. Dims? Okay. For my trusty Nahalem that I refuse to get rid of. Yeah, you and that system. Uh, okay, uh, move on to Chris, who has, uh, he actually stole Ken's pick. He's going with the Yamakasi Cat Leap Q27, Q270 WQHD Pixel Perfect 2560 by 1440 LED monitor. And then we link to Ken's article on uh, the, which one did you have? Shimeon 27 inch. So these are basically the pick is those 27 inch Korean 2560 by 1440 monitors um, that are still kind of mainly only available on eBay, right? Which is, I can't believe that's still the case that somebody hasn't picked these up. Mo Monoprice is supposed to sell them at some point. Yeah, Micro Center has yeah. them in and out, but they have the model that has more input, input lag. So. Mm. All right. so keep an eye on that and look at these ones that uh, Chris detailed here. Company of Heroes 2 pre order. Uh, he said he spent way too much time of his, a part, uh, way too much of his life playing the first one, so he's looking forward to uh, repeating that problem uh, from six years ago. The best RTS game ever made, or one of. And the other pick he has is the Amazon Prime membership, which is a great selection if you just like to buy things all the time. Uh, what, I think it's still seventy-nine dollars, and you get free two-day shipping with it, which is great. Um, and then you can get. Almost anything shipped overnight for three dollars and ninety nine cents, which I ship a lot of stuff to all these guys, and that's a awesome deal. Like I ground shipped a case, no, I ground shipped a box that had uh, three water coolers and a motherboard in it from Kentucky to Texas, and I think it was like forty five dollars. That's for ground, you know, not you know. So I. Terrific deal. Uh, I'm actually surprised they haven't increased the price on that recently. And finally, speaking of Mori, his picks include the Cooler Master CM Storm Sentinel Advance 2 mouse. Um, has a lot of words involved with it. Uh, very particular about his mouse, the field, button placement, and apparently this addresses all of that. And it, it kind of looks like the head of a penis, but I didn't say that. Mm, okay, I guess if you tilt it and squint some, you're a freak. Uh, OCZ Vertex 3 SSD, another SSD makes the list. And the update Samsung, the firmware. Update the firmware, yes. Samsung Galaxy S3 phone. And then uh, finally the Mass Effect 3 Digital Deluxe Edition, which I think has all three games in it uh, available through Steam. No, wait, Origin, I'm sure. I don't really know. Uh, I have to admit I've never played those games. If Colleen ever listens to this, she'll be extremely mad, but um, I've heard nothing but great things about them. So that's uh, our overview of the holiday picks. We kind of went through them step by step. If you missed any, go to the site, pcper.com, check out our picks, uh, and please go into the comment section and leave us what you think might be better choices or additional choices, and maybe we'll add some uh, to the last page of the article as well. We want to see what you guys think uh, tech people need to have this holiday season so are you shocked that i didn't pick the uh gs3 as well well i thought we talked about this just a minute ago uh offline Wait, and it was because where was i somebody somebody had picked it before you i, I know that you yeah. you recommend it you recommend it i know 
Um, oh, sure, it's fine. It makes a great skipping stone. Yeah, yeah, across the lake. Yes. Make sure you make it across the lake. All right, we're going to take a quick break here before we jump into a handful of news items to thank our podcast sponsor um, through pretty much all of 2012, which we're coming up on a close on. So we should all, uh, everybody, I want everybody in Count of Three to say thank you, MSI, for their support. You guys ready? No. All right, well, thank you, MSI. Let's hear from Alex. The all-new Z77 M-Power mainboard from MSI is poised to change the overclocking game. Every Z77 M-Power board will have a factory 24-hour military-class burn-in test completed before shipping. Additionally, performance-optimized features such as GoToBIOS, MultiBIOS 2, V-Checkpoints, Bluetooth 3.0, and onboard Wi-Fi allow users convenience and total system control over their overclocking and gaming experience. This is the new endurance champion, Z77 M-Power from MSI. All right, thank you, Alex, for that. I see people in the chat room saying thank you, MSI, and I appreciate that. Um, yes, we, we wouldn't be able to do the show uh, without their support, and hopefully Alex is listening, and uh, we'll, we'll get some support for, for 2013 to keep this show going. I would hate to have to just yank Josh off the air because um, I don't know what he would That's do gross. on Wednesday's nights. Well, I didn't say yank him off off the air. Just don't do it in front of Alan's TV. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of Alan, let's bring in Alan again, and he's going to talk to us real quickly about uh, something you posted right at the end of last week, or right after last week's show, about the transporter and internet-connected private storage. What what kind of makes this interesting? Uh, this is basically, the easiest way to sum this up is it's a portable version of Dropbox. Put it that way. Okay. Um, basically, everything works the same, except... The burden of the storage, because you know how Dropbox, the, the, whatever your items are, are on all of the computers linked with that Dropbox sure. account. This does all the same stuff, but none of it is in the cloud. Basically, the cloud is the fact that all of whatever connected uh, laptops or other connected devices you have, they're all linking back to the hard drive that's in this unit, okay. wherever it may be sitting. Okay. Right? Um, so basically, it's for people that, you know, you have stuff that you don't want in the cloud necessarily. You want it to be private, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, you don't want to have to deal with subscription fees because there are no subscription fees for this, even though the computers that are away from your home base, house, whatever you want to call it, uh, office, right, those computers still have to somehow figure out how to get to that unit. Mm -hmm. And so their back end, because that does use their service, their servers, to figure out the connection. But it's uh, no different than like something like go to meeting, right? Where it's you, how do you get to your home PC that way? Well, you, it logs into the website, and then you log into the website, and it sort of connects them for you, right? Okay. Uh, that's what their service does. It just tells you, okay, this is how you get back to, you know, the, so, the transporter that's sitting on your desk at home, for example. Does this have the storage internally, or do you attach a USB device to it, or how's that work? Okay, it is internal uh, one or two terabyte hard drive is what it's available with. Okay. And that's, that's how it works. Whatever's in there, and it's, it looks kind of deceptive because the unit itself looks pretty small. The hard yeah. drive actually sits in there vertically. Okay, yeah, I guess there's only one way it could fit looking at yeah, that picture. It's, it's a two and a half inch laptop style hard drive goes in there. So, in theory, um, we could buy one of these here, stick it in this office, and then instead of using Dropbox and paying st for Dropbox, stick it where? Stick it in here. Here, that orifice. This uh, office. Do you, do you, no, not orifice. Do you, office. Do you lube it before you throw it in you there? Always, I mean, you have you seen what that first. looks like? No, you always. And lube uh, it first. where is and the, actually, um, head to? What I was more impressed with by this is that it's meant to sort of be an extension of your router. You know how routers, most routers, their NAS functionality is sort of eh, right? You can't really, you know, even if you're on the home network, the throughput usually isn't anywhere near what yes. the what it should be. Yep. As far as the speed, right? Um, especially if it's a USB connected hard drive to yeah. your router, yeah. for example. Um, this, the con from from what I understand, the con the connectivity out the back of this is not. It's not meant to be wireless. It's not meant to be on your home wireless network. It's gigabit to your router, and did, it did goes. Did you just say the connectivity out the back of this? Yes, exactly. <laughs> just for Josh. Um, it. So it's gigabit Ethernet to your router, and. From what I'm told by them, what the, what the throughputs that you see is basically the speed of the laptop hard drive. Mm. So 
it's it's you know probably almost uh, almost pegging gigabit. I would imagine you know eighty or ninety megabytes per second. Hopefully, right. Um, if it goes that fast, I doubt it. it's not going to go that fast if you're out away from your home. I'm interested um, in this. The, I guess my my concern would be this is you have to have high upstream to take advantage of this, right? If you're trying to connect to files or download files from it. Well, okay. Here's off-site. here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. Say you want to use this as some sort of um, the the, the uh, what I think is the ideal scenario is especially if it's a holiday time. You want your parents or grandparents or whatever to be able to have access to the same huge batch of pictures that you have, mm-hmm. all the kids, videos, whatever, right? Um, but you don't want to have to deal with dumping it all across the internet to get it all there. Correct. And, and, and assuming that you were also trying to use this as meeting the checkbox of off-site backup, right? Uh, so here's what you do. You get the one that you're going to gift to them beforehand. You dump all of your stuff on your transporter. You put it on the same network as yours. If it sees that it's in the same house and under the same behind the same router, basically, it will sync basically like the throughput of your network, not over the internet, right? Sure. Once once you've already done the the big moving of all your files, they're all sitting on the other transporter. Now you gift that to your parents. Now it's sitting at their house. Anything from then on is just going to sync. Any differences are going to sync. Okay. Right? It's only dif- a different sync. It's only the new stuff. So you're not uploading right. terabytes of data right. across, you know, the internet. I'm, I'm interested in the idea of uh, a, a, a local Dropbox, like something that I don't have to pay for Dropbox anymore, and I can have it here. I don't know. There, there's there's some benefits to not having to worry about the uptime of our network in order to access files, um, you know, or to have it copy files over uh, correctly and that kind of stuff. So we'll we'll right. see. When's that Kickstarter? What's it say is the ship date on the Kickstarter? There's, they say they're shipping. It's either January or February next year um, for the early adopter people. Then. We will see soon then. Yep. All right. Um, we've had a lot of talk in the last few weeks about ball grid arrays and socketed processors and people leaving or not leaving. So last week on the podcast, we talked about uh, AMD's response, which was, hey, don't worry, guys. We're going to make socketed processors for the foreseeable future. Or I think they didn't use that exact term because that's what Intel uses. Um, but they, you know, we, we talked about that and said, okay, maybe AMD is trying to make a, a play at this because they have some goodwill they can get out of this. Well, Intel uh, made a very similar claim last week saying, uh, quote, Intel remains committed to the growing desktop enthusiast enthusiast in channel markets and will continue to offer socketed parts in the LGA package for the foreseeable future for our customers and the enthusiast DIY market. However, Intel cannot comment on specific long-term product roadmap plans at this time, but we'll disclose more details later per our normal communication process. So basically, they're just saying uh, they're, they're trying their best to say that the rumors that we first heard were wrong, that they're going to continue the LGA socket. Uh, Josh, you had pretty much said this much. Uh, when we when we talked about this a couple three times, anything stand mm-hmm. out about you on this? There's still going to be the conspiracy theorists that that see the terminology foreseeable future, and cannot comment on specific long-term product roadmaps, and say, well, they're just saying that we would they still have the 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 ability to to, to kind of drop their plans whenever they want. Yeah, pretty much. But you know, if you really think about it, LGA and any socketed processor. In the next 10 years, they're pretty much all going to be gone because if you start thinking about process technology, start thinking about where design technology is gone and how CPUs are going to be in the next 10 years that are eventually going to be essentially just throwaway parts. And you're going to have as much speed as you need. I'm not trying to make a whole Bill Gates. You'll never need more than 640K. But the vast majority of applications, video, gaming, productivity, you're going to be able to do with just some kind of soldered on BGA part, and you're going to be happy with. And it's not until you start getting to heavy-duty scientific 3D modeling. And when I'm talking 3D modeling, I'm talking real 3D modeling, not right. you know 100,000 polygons. We're talking about billions. So until you get to that point, you're not going to need any more real power than that. And and it's just going to be, I mean, if you look in the past five years, uh, go from 1995 to 2000 and take a look at the processors that are available 
and the speed differences. And then in the past five years now, see what we have. I mean, uh, what the the original the Halem is it's almost five years old. Yep. Ask and Alan, Alan's would... still using it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we're 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 slowing down faster than you think. Right. But yeah, it's it's you know they're, 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 we knew that that Broadwell was going to be BGA. The uh, generation after that was going to be offered in BGA and LGA, and Haswell will be LGA. And when Broadwell is released, Haswell will have a couple of higher extra speed grades, and they'll still be LGA. So yeah, we're not we're not getting rid of LGA and, and socketed products for any time soon, but eventually. There's just not going to be a need for swapping out upgrades. I hate to say it, but yeah, eventually physics, physics, and quantum mechanics will only get you so far. Listen, okay, you guys and your—if you had to mess with this every time, oh, I think you're going to show us a woman, and, and so I, I was going to get really scared. You know, when you have to mess. Look with at this. that. Whose choice That's is like, that, Alan? What? <laughs> Whose choice I think, is that? <laughs> I think Spider-Man uh, designed the case. Yes. Slinging stuff all over. Just saying. All right. Jeremy, tell me a little bit more about Crisis 3. Coming out in January, by the way, I think, right? So pretty soon. Yeah, it's not long now. Uh, the, the brilliant news is that it's going to ship with high-resolution textures. We're not going to have to scream and yell at them to finally get them to release a pack, which we can then download to actually sort of make the game look relatively good on a high-end monitor and gaming computer. They've realized that maybe this was a stupid idea for, you know, a company which built a game which was still being used as a joke to today, Will It Play Crisis, to put out Crisis 2, which was just bloody horrible. So Crisis 3 is indeed going to ship not only with high-resolution textures, it's going to have the full uh, gamut of what we're used to seeing on a PC game. So you're going to have objects, particles, post-processing, AF, AA, motion blur, all the stuff that we sort of want to see. And the actual game system is going to have parallax occlusion mapping, it's going to have cloud shadows, fog volume, really stuff that you need a PC to be able to emulate. Uh, apparently, each blade of grass is also going to have its own AI, uh, or at least they can model each blade of grass individually, and it will interact with the NPC and player individually. I will guess. it tickle your toes? Will it cause you to laugh uncontrollably when you walk across it? If you buy that extra USB plug-in, yes. Yes, it will. But don't nice. step on a mine, because that's going to sting. So it's nice to see that a game that originally defined the ultimate PC game for beating the hell out of your system is probably returning to its roots again, at least in spirit, if not in fact, and will hopefully once again start crippling systems everywhere. I hope so. That's, I hope so that's, too. I, say what you want about the game itself, and this is like the worst possible video I could have picked to play, but... The, That's okay. I can't see it. My the graphics, the graphics, and, the, and, and stuff are, are what made these interesting um, to use and to play, and, and, and that kind of stuff. So, hopefully, hopefully, we will see a return to that. Indeed. Although the system requirements, you know, probably because they are just sort of saying, "Buy yeah. the latest quad core, buy the best graphics card you can get." This is good. I like that. Um, also, kind of interesting news this week. Uh, we, we've discussed the rumors about a Valve Steambox for a while, which uh, has always been discussed as a PC that would be in your living room that would run PC games through the Steam interface in, in order to compete in, against consoles. There were uh, job postings that were posted, and they were denied rumors. Doug Lombardi denied the rumors. Well, it turns out after the Video Game Awards on Spike TV last week, I guess it was, uh, over the weekend, Gabe Newell apparently confirmed that they were working on hardware to compete against consoles and living room PCs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they didn't really call it the Steam Box, but that's what it's going to be called. And it all, you know, this is kind of what we expected to happen, right? We saw uh, Big Picture Mode be developed and show up and be released. We saw Linux version in beta. We saw... Um, 
what else? What am I missing here? Uh, oh, non soft, non gaming software on Steam, as well. So some of the some of the quotes from the Kotaku story are pretty interesting. Um, he said they said he talking about Gabe Newell also expects companies to start selling PC packages for living rooms next year. Setups that could consist of computers designed to be hooked up to your TV. Uh, and run Steam right out of the gate. So with that, he's basically saying there are going to be PC packages designed for your living room with Steam out of the box. Okay, great. But then he also said that they're going to build their own. They're going to build their own platform. And he says, well, certainly our hardware, meaning valves, will be more will be a very controlled environment. If you want more flexibility, you can always buy a more general purpose PC for people who want a more turnkey solution. That's what some people are really going to want for their living room. Um, so two things take away that. Both one, he confirmed that they're making something. Valve is going to produce something that you're going to hook up to your TV and put in your living room. But also that it is, quote, a very controlled environment. And we didn't get any more details on what that means. So I'm curious to see what you guys think about that. Is it going to be controlled in the fact of it's going to be a closed box? You're not going to be able to upgrade it at all. Don't talk about talk changing your CPU or your GPU or any of that kind of stuff. Are we talking controlled where you have to use big picture mode? Are we talking controlled where it's going to run on a Linux OS and therefore if it comes out in 2013, even if everything goes as, as planned and, and like lots of game engines start moving over to twenty uh, to, to 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 Linux base uh, compatible, that it will be Valve only titles when it first launches. You guys have any thoughts on that? I think closed uh, to me when I first hear that is that it's going to be in terms of, of hardware, obviously, because they're they're going to want an environment that they control very very closely. They'll be using uh, Linux. Uh, probably they'll work with whoever they're going to do the stuff. I would imagine it would be an AMD APU just because in terms of graphics and software and Linux support, yeah. Intel is, you is think it'd way be an far APU, behind. not a discrete card? Say that again. You, you don't think it would be a discrete card? You think it would be like an integrated APU? No, I, I, I think it would just be an APU. I think that would just you know keep complexity down. Sure. Allow them to uh, to get greater control over the entire little platform, much in the terms of consoles. I mean, sure, it's going to work with you know with with uh, third party C, uh, PCs, but I mean, and stuff you build yourself. But I mean, if they can really optimize the experience with the hardware, right, and you know, cut out a bunch of uh, of the overhead, that they're going to get better performance, better graphics, uh, you know, for the type of hardware they're using and I mean they can really optimize that but, but with a they, closed but, system. Couldn't they do that with a discrete card as well as long as they well, they very specifically know what that discrete card is but then they have you know they can say we're pushing 1080p with high quality graphic settings and that kind of stuff? Yeah maybe we'll see multiple levels but you know using the same hardware like hey you need this this uh, this right. CPU and this this GPU to uh, to conform to this, but I mean, you've got so many other subparts as well with motherboard chipsets and and USB sure. 3.0 and and stuff. You know, on that. I, I think the idea of I, having like three different Steam boxes: one that's 399, one that's 699, and one that's 999. And right, and and what you're seeing is better hardware specs as you go up the line. And um, I kind of put this in that story I, I wrote about this, where. The, the Nvidia GeForce experience that was kind of released in a in a the the most the dumb closed beta I've ever seen, where the first ten thousand people to sign up get in. Um, the idea behind that is, hey, we look at your CPU, your GPU, your memory, and we 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 look at all the most popular games and we preset your settings for the best gaming experience for that. And I see that if you take that kind of technology, couple it with three configurations from Valve that they have verified in terms of hardware compatibility and stability and they sell and that's how you get a PC style console experience that gives you um, you know up maybe not upgradeability but like an upgrade path you, you know if you want better graphics and better performance you can pay for it you can't do that today with with the Xbox and PlayStation that kind of stuff but you still get the ease of use um, with something like GeForce Experience. You still get 10-foot um, 
interface design with with uh, big picture mode and you can use a controller and you can you know if you want to and do that kind of stuff that's kind of where I see like this kind of all coming together I don't know that Valve would choose NVIDIA or if AMD has a similar maybe technology that they're working on um, or it could be something that Steam works on on, the, on, them, uh, on their own and say, hey, look, if you want to be part of, if you want your game to be available in our Steam box, it has to have presets for our three configurations of hardware, right? And I could see them doing that, and that's where we get into a very, quote, controlled environment from them, from a company that, I th it's kind of weird thinking about it because Valve is all about not a controlled environment. That was the whole reason why they were supposedly, you know, if you look back to Scott's editorial about why would why would Gabe and Valve be upset at Windows 8 because it was a controlled environment. Why would they suddenly want to create their own controlled environment? It seems kind of odd. Well, I, I think their controlled environment is just in terms of operating system and hardware. And uh, they want an open marketplace where they can sell as much stuff as possible within their right. terms. Right, within their, yeah. Think of EA and, and uh, what, what uh, Dragon Age 2, that they kicked them off the boat mm -hmm. because of the DLC issues. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's really interesting. I, I think if we see something, we'll see it, not this year, but 2013. I think we'll see it next year. Uh, or at least some more, you know, some more details come out about it. But it, all the steps are there for them to get away from Windows, create all these different things uh, to to come together in this this single single product. But if they make it upgradable uh, it, by purchase wise, so that you can buy different models mm -hmm. of it, and some mm -hmm. of them have a discrete card in it, well, then there's obviously a PCI Express graphics card in there which means a little bit of work with a Dremel and some work on the Linux kernel, and hey, you can upgrade it for free. If we're talking about, like, yeah, hackable parts and all that kind of stuff, yeah, I mean, they, they seem to me to be the kind of company that would be like, well, you paid the money for it. If you change it, we're not going to support it, but Fair enough. we're not going to lock it down, maybe. But I don't know. It's interesting to, interesting to but, debate. Go ahead, Ken. But do we think this thing could survive running Linux. That's, 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 I don't, if, if it's I don't actually running, it could. if it's actually running Linux, it would take a huge, Valve doesn't have that much, it would, it would take a push. huge shift in the software ecosystem. Okay, what's, what's, what's the base operating system for the PS3? Linux. Linux. Yeah, but we're, we're, we're just yeah. now starting to get to the point where people are porting their game, game engines to Windows. And if you're, and with the DX tools, that's fairly trivial for 360 games now. Yeah, I, I like. I, I think I it would be difficult, but I don't. One thing: you're never going to have EA games on the thing, and they're one of the biggest publishers in the world. Yeah, at I least mean, not out of the gate, right? Unless it, it becomes if, a wildly successful thing. But like, but if it's could maybe would they let Origin put their software on there? But it. Or, or put maybe if it EA was Windows, but on there? I don't know. I don't. Uh, EA isn't going to do the dev work to port Origin to Linux. It depends on how big of a market it comes to, it's, and it, will it become a bigger market? So, but what if they release this with Windows? What if they release a Windows-based version? Then of this? it might work. Then it has a better possibility, you know, or at least a better possibility to happen quickly and easily. Uh, well, what does the Wii run on? It. Doesn't matter though, right? Think of think of the peak PC ecosystem Games are being as it sits to the Wii. today. <laughs> yeah, and they're not. They're. We have enough trouble getting high quality games to that ecosystem anyway, and away from the consoles. So I don't. I don't know. I don't think. I, I don't think the Linux structure of the PS3 and Xbox are similar enough to what this would be running that it would be easier to port than it would be to port from a Xbox 360 development environment to Windows. It would definitely be easier on Windows. I don't know. I, but it doesn't make sense why they would suddenly have this focus on Linux if it weren't kind of part of their master plan. Yeah, and, and why, does, why does Valve want to pay Microsoft? Well, they don't. Yeah. They don't. They, they, they don't want to, but they may have to. And uh, well, they've got a whole ecosystem. Two out of three consoles do not run on a Windows-derived operating system. Yeah. Okay. 
The Wii doesn't they count. They simply the, there's the Wii, not the Wii just doesn't a monopoly. Count. Well, it, would would creating the Steam Box then create? I guess the question is, would it be a fourth operating system that people would have to develop to, or is it close enough to something else to be uh, easily transferable between them? Maybe the next, maybe the PlayStation Four will be running on Linux. And it will, well, it will be, and it will, but it will be very close to like a, a standard Linux, and that these two things then maybe make a lot more sense. Maybe maybe, they, maybe it will, right? And if the and if the PlayStation Four is AMD hardware, then this will be AMD hardware. And if the PlayStation Four is NVIDIA hardware, maybe this will be NVIDIA hardware, and then you you get a little bit of compatibility going back and forth there. I, it just seems way too early to be talking about this as a viable product. So many things yeah. have to change in I mean, the they talked about system. It. But you know what? It's a lot of it. fun to talk about it. Is. Right yep. It is. Because yeah. nobody knows a uh, damn thing. And, and, I'm, in, and I'm fact, interested to see how it turns out. It's, it's going to be cool The fact that Gabe way. mentioned it specifically, like he didn't like get tricked into answering this question. Yeah. Right? He had a they full conversation about it. They obviously have a plan. They wanted to talk about it. Yeah. So um, I just don't see... I agree with you that Windows would be way easier to be a much better product, but I don't see them suddenly recanting and wanting to go that Windows route anymore. Um, I think they want to move stuff to Linux, uh, maybe if it's only their games to start out with. I don't know. Yeah, I just don't see how you sell a $400 Valve box. There are a lot of crazy people out there. True. You, if you it's buy a $400 video $400 card, box. you can buy a $400 Valve okay, box. Okay, fair enough. All right, let's move on and talk with Jeremy about low-power atom processors. You wrote this story up. I'm guessing this has something to do with that whole arm in the server room thing. Yeah, well, specifically the fact that they're moving to 64-bit with their new uh, architecture when it eventually arrives. So Intel still claims, you know, they're not really a server chip yet because, well, they're, they're working on it. That hasn't stopped Intel from immediately turning out three new atom processors every single one of which with under a 10 watt TDP. Uh, there's three models, you got the S1240, which is dual core and sucks down about eight and a half watts. And the S1240 and S1220 are both clocked at 1.6 gigahertz, but one is 6.1 watts, one is 8.1 watts. They're all gonna support uh, DDR1333 and have an eight lane PCI Express 2.0 bus on chip. It's not Truly a system on a chip, though, it doesn't have an Ethernet controller, so there will still be a daughter board that handles that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when you're working in a fiber environment, uh, or sorry, a fabric environment, which the interconnects might be a little bit different, it makes sense to have a specialized Ethernet controller. But, I mean, these things are going to be reasonably cheap, uh, $54 a piece in 1,000 unit quantities. So, I mean, significantly cheaper than a Xeon ridiculously cheaper than a Xeon. And even if you buy a whole bunch of them to sop them at the exact same uh, job, like, say, the front part of a web interface, right. it's probably going to be interesting because the density is going to be brilliant. And, you know, it is going to already support 64-bit architecture. And, you know, it puts until into a uh, market position they haven't been in so much before, which is the ultra, ultra low uh, power consumption and uh, heat production. The other nice thing uh, that sort of came out of this was that these ones that are coming out uh, are not actually embedded. So part of the conversation that we've had before has come up when are these just going to be BGA chips that are completely soldered on or, as with most server rooms, are you actually going to stick with LGA so that people can upgrade? Intel says, well, we're, we're still going to have some LGA versions. Didn't come out directly to say that, but reading between the lines, that's what they're saying. So, you know, even on the Atom line, we're not going to see the end of upgradable chips. These guys that are coming out are on the 32 nanometer process. Mm -hmm. We did hear from EE Times that sometime in the very near future, we're going to see 22 nanometer Trigate versions of these processors come out, which should do some interesting things and maybe even drag the uh, power consumption almost down to the point where it's cell phone level. I don't. You'll see them in a cell phone, but the power consumption that's, is going that's to be half about a watt. that level. It's impressive. Yeah. It, it's, it's really very impressive. Josh? Me? Nothing? Anything? 
Uh, you know, for servers, uh, yeah, you're better going to stay at higher wattage than, than cell phones. But, uh, you know, it's good to see uh, an advancement here. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially we've got the, uh, you know, like the C-Micro type guys, even though they've been acquired by AMD. You know, they still may leverage some of these products. We'll see. Uh, other guys, HP, have been pretty aggressive in the low power servers. This will fit in nicely with them as well. But, uh, yeah, I think that a lot of people are probably waiting around for the 22 nanometer stuff to come out a little bit better power uh, and, and better yet, uh, better architectural differences mm-hmm. that will improve, you know, like out of order performance and fun things like that that are very beneficial towards server workloads. All right. Um, other quick news bit here. ASRock announced or showed or we saw a link to a new Thunderbolt motherboard. What's interesting about this is that it's a, it's a dual port board, but it's not the first of that. We, we have a gigabyte board here that we're actually working on a system uh, that has two Thunderbolt ports on it. Uh, this is the ASRock Z77 Extreme 6 slash TB4. It's apparently, they call it the f- world's first four channel, but again, I don't think that's that's accurate, or maybe it was when it launched, I don't know. Um, the interesting thing about this that, that stood out is this feature right here. They call it the exclusive DPN, and don't snicker about it too much, Josh. Um, the world's I'll only, try not to. The world's only Thunderbolt motherboard supporting discrete VGA card via Thunderbolt. Um, so essentially, ASRock is taking the DisplayPort connection from the discrete graphics card, taking it into the motherboard through a DisplayPort input connection, and then sending that back out the motherboard Thunderbolt header. Uh, more than likely, this is simple electronic pass-through, and there isn't much or any logic going on to trick the system. It also raises concerns that the motherboard and display solution won't be officially approved by Intel. Uh, and I say we are, after all, still waiting to see the Asus Thunderbolt EX add-on card for their board to actually go on sale. We have one here, and we've tested it, and it works great. Um, but apparently Intel changed the certification process in the middle of the certification, and uh, Asus doesn't know if they're going to actually ever get that out. And we're getting pretty far after Thunderbolt's release, and Z77's... Was the Z77 launch last CES? Uh, last April. Yeah. It'll say April. So, I mean, it's been a long time. Um, so we're, we're going to try to get one of these motherboards in and see what that works. Keep in mind that we were able to do this sort of, but through software with Lucid. Right? If you use Lucid Virtue MVP software, you could use a discrete graphics card through a Thunderbolt connection on the Asus motherboard or the MSI motherboard or the Gigabyte motherboard that we've, that we've tested. Um, but you don't get the pass-through. This way, you kinda, it kind of seems like you're getting uh, maybe even 100% of the performance. You're not getting any kind of gimmicky tricks or software in the back uh, that, that's, that's kind of handling that stuff. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to get a hold of it. ASRock has a reputation for coming up with some of these unique features that are may not always work yeah <laughs> right right but they're good ideas like you want to see a company that's pushing this forward um but you want them to work but they they don't have a dust collector that's it's true true. <laughs> they don't have they don't have the dust collector all right and our last piece of news uh comes from uh chinese translated vr zone page new details about haswell and the and the core 4000 series of processors and basically this uh diagram here details, rumors at least, of the all of the uh, Core i7, Core i5, 4000 series parts that were released under the Haswell name. Uh, they'll sound very familiar to you. The Core i7 4770K, 4670K, 4570, uh, then you get into some low power stuff. What's interesting about it is that if these numbers are to be believed, the Core i7 4770K is the highest end option, just like the 3770K is today. It has a base clock speed of 3.5 and a turbo boost speed of 3.9 gigahertz. Should sound familiar. It's quad core part with hyper threading. Sounds familiar. Um, it has integrated graphics, but this time it will be improved. It's going to be labeled HD 4600 uh, instead of HD 3000. Clock size 1250 megahertz. Should sound familiar. Dual or channel memory support. Thousand. What's that? Josh. HD 4000 is their highest right now. So yeah, it's just 600 points higher. Oh, okay. Not three. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Uh, dual channel memory and support. And it's not a Radeon. You're sure about that. <laughs> right. Uh, support for DDR3 1600. Sounds familiar. So the, the, the clock speeds and feeds 
are basically the same as the 3770K, but obviously the core is going to be different. So we'll see about that. But what has increased is the TDP goes from 77 watts to 84 watts. Is there anything that can be assumed from that, Josh? Is it better performing graphics? Is it a less efficient core for the first iteration of Haswell, do you think? Um, is it, is, or is maybe performance going to be, the performances, performance difference between Ivy Bridge and Haswell going to be extreme, and that's why, uh, you know, they're willing to give us the, the 7 watt TDP difference. How big of a difference was uh, Nahalem from Sandy Bridge per clock? Uh, in wattage or in performance? Well, well performance per watt. Oh, uh, significant. Yes, and I think we're going to see the same thing here. I mean, it's a it's a, a totally new architecture from Intel, not only on this GPU side, which is apparently going to be a big jump, but also on the CPU side. And it's still a 22 nanometer part, so they're going to have more transistors. Yep. No matter what they do, to get the improvements that they're looking at. And so that's going to be wattage. And so, yeah, only going up 7 watts for a part that's clocked the same, but is probably going to be about 15 to 20% faster in pretty much every metric you could throw at it. I think that's, that's money well spent. Or at least we'll thermal see. overhead well spent. We, we will see. Uh, again, that's still rumors, and they're very early in the rumor rumor mill in that area to part two. So even though we kind of did uh, our hardware software picks for the week in long form with our holiday gift guide, I figured we'd go ahead and do one more um, just because that's part of what the podcast is. So sleigh bells ringing and jing, jing, jingling too. So here, Can we do that at the same pick. time? No, let's not. It's hard to do it in time. We, we sing together a lot, but uh, it's hard to do it I'm in time. I'm not sloughing it. All right. So my pick is, so I get to deal with a lot of laptops, and at the end of the day, kind of like we saw in our holiday guide, I like extended batteries because I prefer to have long battery life as opposed to sleek design. Ultrabooks, not really for me. As compared to girth, right? Correct. So, the size of the battery? <laughs> yes. So here's what I bought. I bought the same laptop I've had essentially for the last five years. This is the Lenovo X230. And uh, it has it got about eight and a half eight out eight hours and forty five minutes or so on the PC perspective battery test with the nine cell battery, which is this one sitting out here. But then I also got this slice battery, which makes it thicker, slice. obnoxious. Um, if I, spice, if I close spice, it here, baby. So uh, you know, if we compare that to like uh, my Lenovo, uh, it's not going to work. I got too many cables connected to it. My Lenovo X. X1, uh, it's it's a very different animal, right? So here's here's Ken's MacBook Air. Here's my uh, X230 with the slice Do you like battery. live in 1997, Ryan? I mean, seriously. Look yes. at the size of that thing. Because, and here's the thing. Does it have a, a It's on a dock screen. I mean, <laughs> it's it's, it's ever, on a slice battery. Even it's take the dock off, screen. though, and it's still a fair size. Yes, yes. And it's, but here's the thing. I tested uh, the Lenovo Yoga. I tested the uh, ThinkPad X1. I tested, you know, we're talking four and a half hours of battery life, right? Well, that's not good enough for me when I'm out at CES or something like that or Computex and I need battery life. And I don't really feel like having to find a, 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 an outlet all the time. Um, this machine with the slice battery went for 14 hours on the battery so it test. Loved, it loved you a long time, It did, right? a very long time. A very long time. And I got it super cheap. It was $800 or so with the extra battery uh, when, during all the Black Friday sales and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it, there's just something about it. I had, the X, I had the X200, and then I had the X201, and now I have the X230. And it's just you can throw them against the wall. You can throw them on the ground, and they just work. And the battery life is great. The keyboard is great. And I just I don't I don't know what to say. I have nothing else. It's a backlit keyboard. Yes, it is. Actually, this does have a backlit keyboard. It has two USB 3.0 ports. It has Mini Display Port. It has VGA output, which is important. Um, and it's not super light like this. I think it, how much did I say it weighed with the with the slice battery? It's about five pounds. 
about five, maybe five and a half pounds with the slice battery on it. Um, so that's that's my pick. Uh, as Durs says in the chat room, it's a man's laptop. It's one of your girly thin laptops. <laughs> Lee, Jeremy, Jeremy. Go you on. Cut cake. when you can carry a Toshiba satellite around all day, then I'll be impressed. I'll bring a Alienware M17X with me to CES. It's about 45 minutes of battery life, huge screen. Go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, well, I finally decided that this is going to be a uh, an Infinity Christmas. Of course, I need to find something relatively affordable. You know. A monitor floating around $150, $180, and Josh convinced me that it is time to toss TN to the side, just like I tossed my CRT to the side. So looking around, I found uh, the Asus VS229H-P on sale at Newegg, uh, both in the U.S. and Canada, for $150. Free shipping in Canada. Uh, it's not quite 5 milliseconds gray to gray. It is an IPS screen, but... It's decently fast. Uh, a lot of the reviews that I've seen have described it as, you know, reasonable for gaming. And it is an IPS. It is a 1080p screen. And I can afford three of them. So this is good. Because while I That's would love to have cheap. three cat leaps, it's not going to happen this Christmas. It was worth a shot, though, huh? Oh, it was, it was a nice dream. but And I can still dream it. Because, I mean, they're only going to get better. I mean, 1440 screens, yep. ah, maybe they'll be passe. We'll move to 1600 or higher. So, for now, I don't know. This is not looking so too bad. So, 3D screens for 450 bucks is yeah. only $50 more expensive than a single leap? Yeah, a single one. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's, it's easy. But then you can use that same logic where you can get three cat leaps for at the price of one 30-inch ultra-sharp. From Dell. And while I do appreciate the suggestions coming down uh, from the chat room, you're doing Newegg.com, not Newegg.ca. Mm, yeah. The pricing is different and the shipping is obscene coming across the border. Not to mention, <laughs> you know, me. that yeah. lovely little customs thing. Boo. So, you know, I have to pick and choose. There was an LG, an LG that was a 23 inch about the same price, which was attractive. Until I started reading the reviews and described it as slow, even for an IPS monitor. Not so much. All right, we'll move on to Josh. One make breaking news, everybody. Google Maps is now back in the iTunes store. Well. <laughs> Does it have that Australian I just tried to uh, it. in it? I just tried to download it and said it's no longer available, but that oh, could just be a... Good job, Apple. All right, yeah. Josh, what is your pick? Me. Uh, you know, going along with SSDs because everybody needs one, and uh, I have no imagination whatsoever. Mm. Today's big deal is the Intel 335. It's for 169 for the 240 gig version. Now, of course, this uses the new 20 nanometer IMFT. Is that correct, Alan? IMFT. Alan. Yes, IMFT. 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 Yes. Yeah. Thank you. God, you're Wait, which so model slow. though? Where's your latency, dude? It's way up there. The what? I don't the know. The 335. The 335. But the 335. It's it's Is the latest the... 20 nanometer stuff. Yes, it's the 20 nanometer stuff. Oh gosh. What? Why do we even pay this guy? Wait, we. Pay and him? by when I say we, I mean Ryan. Move on. What is your pick? He wants Civ 5. One, His pick one, is the drive. 169. It's right. a great, you know, for great. 240 gig drive, Sand Force 2, Intel optimized firmware. Ooh. <sighs> Pretty nice. All right. Alan, what do you got for us? Uh, my pick, and I can show it on the camera, he's... is that thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is a mm -hmm. uh, five and a quarter inch, six. SSD bay it is. hot swap enclosure. Look at the blinking lights. And the blinking lights, yeah. How, how thick are those all SSDs? Those are, they're, getting all, they're getting all blown out on the webcam. Okay, so th that actually supports 7mm um, and 12mm. 12mm is a damn close fit. Like, they put the 12mm SSD in there, and it's riding up against the bottom of the next, uh, the next cage up as it goes in. Um, they, they see it rolling. They, they fit. So there's a, actually the bottom two drives in there are 12 inch um, 
form factor, and they fit. Uh, so it's a pretty good enclosure. It's on Newegg for like seventy five bucks, I think. Um, it has it has those fans that Ryan hates. Uh, just a word of warning: it has those really high RPM one uh, U yeah. rack style fans. Two of them in it. However, if you unscrew the back of the enclosure before you put it in your case, if you're just going to put SSDs in this thing, they're not going to get hot enough. There's plenty of air vent holes all around this thing, and it's an aluminum enclosure, so it's going to conduct heat away anyway. Um, so if you're doing nothing but SSDs in there, take the back of the thing off as soon as you buy it, and you can remove the rear plate, and then uh, the unit with the fans just slides out, and then there's just those little uh, you know, two conductor plugs that you can just yank the plug on. Um, and, you know, basically disconnect the fans, and then you can put the assembly back together, which is what I did. I didn't want to hear, you know, a 10,000 RPM or 15,000 RPM fan whine Good coming, from a, coming from a solid-state drive cage where the SSDs are making no heat. So, yeah. All right. But it's, it's, it's good. Um, I used to have the 4-bay model of, from the same company, which was just as good, but that holds six. It's a perfect that's, pairing for, for any of the Intel motherboards, right, because they have six... Really I, I don't even look at it, Ryan. It does drives. read. Say so what? Are they all OCZ drives? Are they 240 gigs Sandforce twos? What are they? What's in mine right now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do there's you have inside? Four, there's four Intel 710s that I'm trying to beat up and fragment on purpose. Okay. That's what's in there. All right. I'm not using the and so you got two that are nothing in there. There'll be something in there. Whatever. Sure. Come on. I, throw them in, if you know what I mean. <laughs> that's it. We're moving on. Um, oh, good. That's the end of the show. How convenient. Uh, PCPer.com slash podcast is the URL to share with friends, family. Uh, listen to an episode while you sit around the fire during the holidays. Uh, and if you happen to be sitting around the fire during the holidays on Wednesdays at 10 p.m., you can watch us live, and you never know what the hell is going to happen. PCPer.com slash live is the URL for that. Uh, again, please uh, find us wherever you find all great content at PCPer.com, which would be like, you know, YouTube.com slash PCPer, Twitter.com slash PCPer, Facebook.com slash PCPer, other places um, that I'm sure I'm forgetting right now. Gplus.to slash PCPer, that's still a thing. That's right. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you guys for joining us. We will have uh, another episode next week on the 19th. And then the week after that, we'll, we'll have to discuss internally here and figure out where everybody's going to be on the 26th. And then the next week after that will be our, uh, our New Year's episode. Hey, everybody be wearing hats. And uh, we'll probably do like CES predictions, maybe best of the year type of uh, thing. We'll, we'll figure something else interesting. And then we go to CES. And three of the four of us will be there. Jeremy will not be joining us this year. Because uh, flights out of Canada are ridiculous. In lovely Las Vegas. But uh, we'll, we'll try to do podcasts but you know, every I, night I, there. I, I, will, I will certainly appreciate being in a bed with Jeremy not in there and slamming his legs back and forth because of restless <laughs> leg syndrome. That wasn't his As legs. As I'm bouncing off of the bed. <laughs> that's, that's, just, uh, that's just like it was like trying to get you to like leave. Right. Yeah. Just, oh no, I have no, this was him over. Yep. Help when you know his <laughs> heels are kicking my uh never mind. Yeah, let's not I do that. I told you it wasn't his leg. <laughs> that's that's awful. That's awful. Let's get the hell off of here. If you if you're hanging around in the live uh chat room and you want to play some Planet Side two, that's what we're gonna try to do after the show. So hang around for that if you are interested. So we'll see you guys next week. I'm Ryan Schrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malmontano. So usually Alan has the delay. This time it was Josh. Huge delay. It bounces around. Huge delay.